Hello world, it's Craig. In the last video on this PLS 881, I covered the last couple of months of progress from when I first found this board on eBay and bought it and the background documentation. In this video, we're going to catch up where I am today over the last few days in reverse engineering this board and capturing the schematic. So here's the schematic now, the, its current status, but I'm going to back up on some few details to show you how I got to this point. For the most part, this video is going to be about my reverse engineering process, but as it's applied to this board. And what I'm going to show you today is one of the ways that I attack this problem. I have three or four favorite ways to reverse engineer boards, but this is the process that I use most of the time, and it requires no special tools or software, and it's a nice generic technique when you have a fairly simple board and you know everything's fairly straightforward. I start with a new KiCad project, and you can download KiCad for free. Now I know sometimes when you're watching people do things on the screen it can be annoying and disorienting and I'm really going to try not to give you motion sickness by jumping around too much but I do need to zoom in on uh, certain things so that you can see it. So the first thing I do with this, so I have the blank page and the first thing I do is I go through and I put in the known components. And in this case we have 82102 RAMs and I already had those in my library. We have 2708 EEPROMs, I had those, the 8080. The edge connector, I just put in a generic card edge connector, but uh, I did save the card edge connector in a project library because it is specific to this device. We also just used standard crystals, the individual capacitors, resistors, and these uh, 4.7K common rail uh, resistor packs. So these were all just placed in the normal manner, you know, from pulling components out of the library and doing the place, duplicating it. Then putting in the component ID that's on the silk screen for those components. And if the board doesn't have component IDs, then I just assign my own. So where we are on the schematic right now, all the ones that you can see are filled into the yellow. Those are just standard placed library components. So now if we look at the unknown components. I have a library of generic components. And... For example, in this case, I just pulled some of the generic 14-pin and 16-pin DIP packages. And the reason they're generic is I just have the package with the number of pins, but then all of the pins are listed as having an unknown function. I create a local project library, and for each unknown device, I bring into that library a duplicate of each component and I name that component in the library with the component ID. So if we look in the library, we can see I have one over here called components, and this is just specifically for this library, and I have the components, and these are all the unknown components on this board. So to be clear, I don't place multiple copies of the same component in the schematic. As you can see here in the library, I've created a standalone unique duplicate of each component. And the reason these are standalone duplicate entries in the project library is because as the project goes along, I will change the pin names and signal type to match what I figured out about that component. So as you can see, just the generic component, we've got 16 completely unspecified pins. But as I learn things about that, I'll go through and change the pin name and the pin function to be a power input or an input or an output. And you don't have to change these, but it helps the overall process because once you've identified these pins as inputs and outputs or power, it can help the schematic check feature uh, reduce the possibility of errors because now we can go back and check for simple things like multiple outputs connected together, no output driving the net, no power connected, and so forth. So on this board so far, I've got two generic 14-pin DIP packages for U7 and U15, and then there's 16 16-pin 16 DIPs representing all the other unknown components. Now I take those components and I place them on the schematic in kind of the same order, the same placement that they are on the board. It just makes going back and forth between the two easier. Unfortunately, to completely match the board, I would have to have all of these components upside down with pin 1 at the bottom and I just refuse to do that. So while the placement is about the same, all of these are upside down compared to the board. But that's my preference, you can do it however you like. Then I go through and I put a wire stub on each of the components. So you can see there's just a little stub that comes out. It's not connected to anything. And the only purpose of those little stubs is to assign a net name to that wire. Now here's the thing to understand about KiCad, is that 
much of what you do when you're making a schematic is just for aesthetics and to make the schematic more reasonable when you sit down to look at it on a piece of paper. So placing buses, for example, makes the schematic look nicer, makes it easier to follow, but they are entirely cosmetic. All that really matters to KiCad is the network of connections between each point or each pin on each component. So each of these network connections is a net, and each net has a unique name. Normally, the net names are just something that KiCad makes up. So for example, if you, you select one of these nets down here that doesn't have a name put on it, you can look down here in the corner, and the selected net is net uh, U27Pad7. So that's just the name that KiCad gave it as soon as I brought that component in. U27Pin7, that's just its default net name. Now to create the schematic, I'm simply managing net names one by one by changing them from their default values to something that creates a meaningful network of connections or these nets. So this is important and it's the basis of this whole method of reverse engineering without making a nasty, a nasty rat's nest of just wires going everywhere on this drawing. So it's important to understand that KiCad will connect items together on the same net if you do any of the following. If you explicitly connect them with a wire. So if you were to just take the wire tool and you were to explicitly connect these two together, it would connect those as a net. And those two pins would now be connected together. So let me undo that. The second way to connect them together is just simply give them the same net name. Here's one called RAM chip enable. If I just copy that, it creates a copy of that net name and I can place that anywhere. So let me put it down here on pin nine. And now, as far as KiCad is concerned, pin nine and pin five are connected together. Okay, let me delete that before I forget. The third way you can connect net names together are to put the same, are to put different net names on the same wire. So for example, down here I have some where I'm not quite ready to rename it yet. So here U158, which is just the net name that I gave this, that it's U15 pin eight, that's the original net name I gave it. But as I've gone through the schematic, I've come to understand this signal and I'm going to eventually change the signal to memory read or not memory read. But I'm not quite ready to commit to that yet. When I'm ready to commit to it, I'll do a global search and replace. But for right now, I just want to connect those two nets together. And so you can do that by just putting both net names on the same wire. Put both net names on the same wire. And now as far as KiCad is concerned, those are now part of the same net. Okay, so those are the three ways that you can connect things together. You don't have to just run wires everywhere and make a rat's nest out of this. And as you can see on this diagram, for the most part, I've completely ignored wiring things together. I just use net names to connect them. You know, now we can look at, we can use the highlight net tool. So if we click on the highlight net up here, the icon, we click on A0. And so on all of the RAM chips, we have A0 with the same name, and they are part of the same net. If we were to delete that name off of one of these, it would no longer be considered part of that net. You know, more formally, you would have a bus connecting these, and you would have bus entries, and it would look really nice. But as far as KiCad's concerned, it wouldn't make a difference in the diagram. Obviously, if this were just a printed schematic and we had to rely on the printed net name to find connections in the schematic, it'd be entirely unusable. There's no way you could you know, sort through and sift through all the information just with the textual net names. But a, a full, conventional, fully drawn schematic will come later once we have these netlist schematic completed. And you can create a netlist from this drawing and look at it any time. You just do click on the generate netlist. It'll come up, it'll say, how do you want to generate it? You can just say, you know, PCB new is fine. You can then open that net list. Here's this specific net list. Uh, and if we search that for a zero, which is the one that I have highlighted, you can see here that, you know, a zero is connected to U19, U19 pin eight, U24 pin eight, ROM 1, pin 8, and all these others. So it tells us every place that A0 is connected, and that's what's represented here in the magenta. Another thing is you can save these net lists as a part of your revision control because you can reverse create the schematic using the net list, or you could import it to another CAD package.
just using this netlist. So, you know, the netlist is kind of a nice thing. Every once in a while, just create the netlist under a different file name, and you can use that for your revision control too. All right, so I have all of the known components placed. And then what I do is I went through uh, the 8080, and I started at that as, you know, kind of it being the master, and I went through and I assigned the net names to all of the stubs on the 8080. I then went over to the card edge connector and I did the same thing since we knew the signal names on the card edge connector. Now it's an important point to make sure that if a signal name coincidentally happens to have the same name on these two devices, if you give it the same name, it's going to connect them together in KiCad. It's going to consider them to be the same net. So when I was naming these two components or assigning the net names on these two components, I made sure, because I wasn't actually checking the board, I was just assigning the names based on the device. I made sure that none of these had exactly the same name. And except for the power and ground and the, the minus 5 volts, everything here happened to have a unique name. So it might be you know ready or, or reset on the 8080, but it was just the, the not reset or RST on the card edge connector. So they didn't happen to have the same name. Now when it comes over to things like the 2708s, you know, these are also connected to all the addresses. But before you can give them the exact same net name, you need to make sure that they are physically connected on the board. So that's when you start looking at the traces, you get comfortable, you get your continuity tester out, and you go through each of these, you know, from A0 to A9, check them on the 8080, and then confirm that in fact they're going to all of the ROMs and they're going to the RAMs. So you know the things that you you intuitively know these are going to be connected those are the ones that are easiest to check first. Once you confirm that they're connected one by one you know you would go to A0 on the 8080 you would click the C it would capture that net name you would drag it over and put it on A0 on uh, you know this first 2708 and then you would measure on the board you would confirm it was connected you would copy that and put it over on a zero on the next 2708 just repeat that process until we have all of the you know the simple ones done for all of the known components so we do that on all the addresses uh, the power and ground we could test those I assigned a unique net name for each of the chip selects on each of the ROMs and a unique uh, data read and data write for each of the bits on each of the RAMs because you know each RAM is holding one bit so I assigned you know here's a, a data write 4 and a data write data read 4 data write 3 data read 3 so forth for each of the RAMs went through and confirmed those were all connected and you know those were all basically just straightforward just you know nothing but the ohm meter to check these things to make sure they were connected you know the way that you would expect them to be connected then you start fishing around on the board for things that you know are not quite as straightforward but you know they somewhere have to be connected so for example here on the 8224 so that's the clock generator chip you look at the reset signal and you know that that reset signal comes off of the clock generator it went through this resistor r8 determined that reset signal comes out and you know that has to go up to the 8080 measure that on the board sure enough it goes up to 8080 pin 12 but you also I noticed on the board that it went a couple of other places it went over here on U18 to pin 5 so confirm that then you just copy the reset net name from the 8224 over to pin 5 on U18 and instantly connect those two together as I mentioned earlier, I prefer to copy and paste existing net names, and that just prevents making a mistake and inadvertently creating a new net that's not actually connected. You know, if you make a difference in the capitalization or in the spacing or anything like that, you're actually creating a new, a new net. So the foolproof way is to just hover over it with your cursor, press the C key to make a copy of it, and drag it over to where you want to put it. The other thing that is kind of handy when you're doing net names is if you're assigning a new net name the way that I prefer to do that is you come over here and you pick the place net label icon you then go to the wire you're going to connect it you click on it it brings up the label properties here's where you would give it the new net name and what I do if I'm assigning a new one is I 
click over here on the pull down and I look at all of the net names that there are and you know before I assign a new net name I click or I check to make sure that I haven't already assigned that name to something else because if you were to just type in you know weight here and there was already a capitalized weight down here which there is it would connect those two together and that may not be what I intended so I usually either drag a net name or if I'm going to create a new one I use the pull down to make sure that I'm not duplicating inadvertently a net name and connecting things together that really aren't connected together as I suggested in the last video the first thing I wanted to do was focus on the address decoding for the memory because I just want to get this thing going and do some memory fetches so I can get my serial port hanging on this so starting with the chip selects uh, which are pin 20 on the ROMs as I said I gave each of them a unique net name on the prom itself we can see that if I zoom in so here's ROM 3 chip select ROM 2 chip select and so forth and I just chase those back to the 80 to this uh, chip 27 which is the one that was up in the top left corner and one by one I confirmed how they were connected it quickly became apparent that U27 was not going to be a 74 138 uh, you know a 3 to 8 decoder there's nothing to prevent it from being the 7442 you know kind of like what I was just suspecting in the last video but it's way too early to say for sure whether that is a 7442 so so for right now I just continued uh, finding the connections to this to basically prove that it's not a 7442 and if I make all the connections and it still looks like a 7442 that's I'm gonna go ahead and call it and say that it is since the memory is internally decoded with address lines, you know, 0 through 9 in, in the devices, you know, the 2708 has address 0 to 9 connected. It's internally decoding those. So address 10, 11, and 12 probably need to come over to this decoder. So I specifically chase those down. I go over to the 8080, look for address 10, and find it over here on the decoder. So when all is said and done, and I find everything that I think is connected to this decoder, I think these others are not connected, but again I can't prove it you know since this board has the sockets on it it's easy you know something could have slipped out underneath the socket and I couldn't see it so I'm not putting no connection flags on these other pins but right now I think I have everything connected to this U27 it still looks like a 7442 so you know almost positive this is a 7442 decoder now that I'm convinced of that I can open this up in the library so you just click on it you say properties edit with the library editor and you can go back and change the pins to reflect the 7442 so pin 16 for example uh, you edit that and now I'm going to make that a power input and I'm going to call that VCC pin 8 I'm going to edit that and call that ground and that's another power input and pin one's an output edit that this is uh, device select zero that's an output and so forth go through now everything on this 7442 I'm convinced that's what it is I actually can change the name to a 7442 save that component and you know that's now written in stone Go ahead and save that. I'll come back and change them, uh, finish changing them later. So here's where I can give what I think is a really valuable hint. I've called this U27. I'm saying it's going to be a 7442. I'm convinced that's what it is. I'm going to adjust the pinouts on this library component. But I want to kind of document how I came up with that idea. So I create, while I'm doing all of this, I create a narrative document. And here's what my narrative looks like so far. Let me drag it over here from a different window. This is my narrative. This is a portion of it. If I were just looking on this page, this is, uh, you know, step 20. I'm looking at U8 and U9. U8 and U9 are, uh, let's go back over here to the schematic. U8 and U9 are these two devices down here. As it turns out, you know, looking back on it, they're, some, they're a bus transceiver. But at the time I was doing this, I didn't know that. So here's step 20, U8 and U9. I put in here, they're starting to look like multiplexers or transceivers. And this is what I know about it. This is what it looks like. This is what it has to be. This is where, where I am. And this is where I'm just not sure. 
we can here's another example 21 where I actually came up I came to a conclusion if we look at pin 21 this is one of the latches and this was a latch that is you know capturing the bus state so I said okay we've got this sync latch it's going to the status strobe inverted u6 has to be a latch so I'm looking for a latch with the following it's either gonna be a quad or a hex has to be 16 pins 9 is a clock these are the data writes and then I said okay well a 74 174 doesn't fit then I did some more you know connecting of things on the schematic I said pin 1 is a clear input since it's the reset from this u7 to uh, chip so then I said well a 74 175 fits because pin 1 is the clear pin 9 is the clock these are the inputs these are the Q outputs and these are the Q bar outputs so I put in here okay I'm gonna to commit to the 74 175 add the bus state names to the outputs okay so that is kind of my thinking when I went through and I was defining what let's see now it's these this uh, it was it was these two down here these two latches I think it was u6 I was working my way through what u6 needed to be now this narrative helps me in a couple of ways the first is that I tend to work on projects in spurts so for example if if I ordered some components and they arrive a couple of weeks later I'll jump off of this project and go back to the project that I was working on when I ordered those components or maybe you know circuit boards showed up that have been in the mail for a month and I want to build and, and test the circuit board so I can get that project turned around quicker then I'll jump off that and go over to the circuit boards or maybe you know, maybe just the weather turned clear and I'm hard at work on another hobby for a couple of three weeks but the narrative helps me that when I come back to this project sometimes the narrative is the only way that I can catch myself back up in a reasonable period of time to remember remember where I was with this project the other thing this narrative does is it creates a history for me to undo things if I later find that I made a mistake when I was making a decision so I can go back to this narrative if, if something just in the future is not making sense I can go back to this narrative and and say why did I pick this particular chip what was my justification for that and I can decide okay is this where I made the mistake did I make the mistake before this or after this so having the narrative creates a way to it's kind of a revision control it helps me deduce uh, or, or, or find where I made a mistake in deducing what a chip was or how a chip created the signal name and so forth because remember this is like a giant game of minesweeper and if you make a bad decision there can be many follow-on decisions that are no longer based on valid data and they're all subject to review so the narrative helps me unwind things when I've gone down a wrong path and it also reminds me of what I was thinking when I made that decision along those lines I also just every once in a while you know when I get to a new bullet point in the narrative I just make a new PDF of the schematic you know I don't bother with trying to do revision control in in KiCad I just make a PDF of the schematic save it with the time and date and you know that way I can capture the status before each of the major decisions I can look to see what I had signal names and you know then if I accidentally did a, a global uh, uh, search and replace and found out that I didn't want to do that or I, I mixed two things together I can just go back a revision by looking at the schematic it's a little bit more work than actually having a revision control but revision control is such a mess in in uh, KiCad I don't even bother with it so just just make a PDF you know every once in a while the position that this schematic is in now you can see there's a lot of things that I have named because I know what they are there's still some others that are just kind of given the original generic name you know here's u10.1 here's u7.2 and you know those were just original names that as soon as I started tracing that wire I had to give it a net name and so it just gave these generic names let's look at u18 this is that one that in the last video I was pretty sure this was going to be a 4049 CMOS inverter and that was simply because I had seen it done that way on other boards and also that's the way that Prolog did it on that uh, 8821 board before committing that to the 4049 inverter I wanted to you know not prove that it was but at least prove that it fit 
and there were a couple of ways that I could do that. So on U18, I was able to trace the reset line from the clock into pin 5, and then independently, because there was the not reset on the card edge connector, I was able to trace the not reset independently back into pin 4. So that told me that, you know, without even knowing anything about what that chip was, it told me that U5 was reset and U4 was not reset. I did the same thing with the interrupt, and that told me that pin 2 was the interrupt and pin 3 was, I'm sorry, not the interrupt, yeah, the interrupt request, essentially. Pin 2 was the interrupt, and pin 3 was the not interrupt request coming from the bus. So I had these two signals that were, you know, confirming that, somewhere in here they were being inverted in this device and those were done without assuming anything about u18 so again it didn't confirm it as a 4049 but at least it didn't exclude it as a 4049 and you know there's a lot of things that could be in there that would be doing inverting besides a 4049 hex inverting buffer and unfortunately that was the end of the easy information on u18 it has pin 16 connected to 5 volts and pin 8 connected to ground as any standard 7400 chip but pin 1 was also tied to 5 volts and pin 7 was also tied to ground the only other information i had on this was i knew that pin 14 was coming from the 8080d bin so pin 14 had to be an input and the same for pin 9 because pin 9 was coming from the status strobe on 8224 so all i knew about this was that Two of these signals were being inverted, two of the other lines were inputs. But fortunately, I had that 8821 uh, prologue board that I had purchased, and it had the exact same layout, same identifiers, everything was exactly the same on that, and that was the 4049. So with the little information I had from this chip, and that being a 4049, you know, I was I was ready to call this a 4049. The only thing that was confusing was that Pin 16 is not 5 volts on the 4049. Pin 1 is the power input pin. Pin 16 is not connected internally. And this board had both of them connected to power. So it was a small detail, but it, you know, it left that little bit of doubt onto what U18 really was. So if it hadn't been for having that 8821, I wouldn't have called this a 4049 yet. I would have, I would have waited until I had more information on that. There weren't a lot of other pins that there weren't a lot of other chips that fit this because of the power configuration. So while I declared this the 4049, I made it clear in my narrative that this was, you know, a presumption and it was based on having that 8821 and the fact that I had these signals that were inverted and these other two signals that had to be input that all matched the 4049. But I put it in my narrative that, hey, this is a bit of a presumption, but I'm not going to change it uh, to the library 4049 because that would break this up into logic gates and I don't want it. I, want, I don't want the schematic becoming logic gates yet. I just want it to be, you know, generic dips so far. So I'm not going to change this uh, or any of the devices to their library ones until I'm actually preparing the full-blown, you know, final schematic. We now have known signals. So things that were just given generic names before, I now will give them a true name. For example, here on pin 11, we have a signal that's U15 pin 8 and that's coming in on 11 and I don't have any idea what U15.8 is as far as a signal but by golly I know now that what's leaving this pin is not U15.8 you know the inverse is leaving this same thing with the status strobe status strobe came from the 8224 it comes in on pay on pin 9 and I know for a fact that status strobe now is leaving on pin 10 inverted I mentioned this earlier but you know sometimes when you're about to change a name to something you're not confident enough uh, you can you can just put two net names on the same stub and temporarily connect them together you can sleep on it and then when you come back later you can go ahead and do a global search and replace so for example this one we were just looking at this u15.8 uh, I have come to understand this to be the memory read or not memory read and eventually, you know, I'll do a, a global replace on this and get rid of U15.8 everywhere. And then this, instead of being, uh, you know, not U15.8, this will become a memory read signal. So there's no reason to rush these renamings. You can always just tack them, the two nets together by putting them on the same wire.
So if you look at where I am now, I have about half of the components identified and, and, and connected. I don't I haven't done the resistor packs yet, but all of the memory, the decoding, the 8080, the clock, this inverter and the RAM, and these logic gates down here, uh, U15, U7, and the latches for the machine state status, I have identified, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure I know what those are. U15 and U7, as it turns out, are the only two just logic gates on this, on this uh, board. U7 is just an inverter, and U15 is a 7400 to input and AND. Of these, U7 was much easier to figure out because it had some good connections. You know, first it was connected to the, the RST and the not RST on the finger edge. So just like the, that 4049, it was apparent that there was some inverting going on inside this thing. So I immediately started to think, okay, well, it's either going to be a NAND, a NOR, or an inverter. It was also inverting the reset signal from the 8224 clock to create a not reset signal that was going out to the finger. And it was inverting the weight between the fingers and the 8080. So this pretty eliminated the possibility of it being anything from except for an inverter. Pins 1, 3, and 6 were connected together. That matched an inverter package. So at most, one of those three was an output, uh, unless this was open collector. But there were no indications of being any pull-ups on this, uh, these lines, so I was pretty sure that this wasn't open collector. I followed the not bin signal and the status strobe signal into this chip, and everything, it really only came together if U7 was just the standard 7404 in a standard N package. U15 up here was a little harder to figure out. This one was actually a bit of a bear. You know, we were all taught as suckling infants that since the NAND is the most basic gate, almost every board is going to have at least one NAND device on it. And this board has an amazingly few number of glue chips. And since the other 14 pin dip was an inverter, statistically, that leaves this one to be the NAND. And I'm really only half joking here because for this device, I started with the presumption that it was a NAND. You know, I had some kind of a clue that there was inversion going on in this. So just like the other one, I thought it was either going to be a NAND or a NOR, possibly an invert. But I just had the feeling that this one was a NAND. And so I basically said, okay, well, prove that this isn't a NAND. And I worked my way through that. We had the not right from the 8080 coming in. And it was connected to two pins, pins four and five. And there were three sets of pins that were connected together. So one and six are connected together. 4 and 5, 10 and 11. So either those were inputs or we were taking an output and feeding it back into the same device. But the only signal I knew for certain were the not right on pins uh, 4 and 5. And I knew that pin 3 was connected to the RAM read-write signal. So pin 3 was either an output that was generating that signal or it was just another input that was you know reading that signal connected to the same net. You know. I couldn't say for sure whether pin 3 was creating the signal or whether it was just another input. I had suspicions about some of the other signals like the not out and the not memory read, but I hadn't nailed those down at that point. So I basically had in my mind that this was a NAND, but I wasn't going to commit to it. I basically just gave up on this chip because I, I didn't think I had enough information to, to call it a NAND. And I went back to the data bus to try to find that status byte latch that I've been looking for this whole time. Now, if we look over while I was looking for that status byte latch, we see an interesting little decision that Prolog made here. U8 and U9, they early on started to look like they were bus transceivers. So the data, the data bus came off of the 8080 and it came over to U8 and U9. And these were the items, this was, was, was 20, item 20, I think, that we were looking at earlier in that, uh, that uh, narrative. But I gave up on it back then in that, in that line 20 because it just wasn't making sense. These weren't, they needed to be bus transceivers. They were looking a lot like multiplexers. It just wasn't making sense. So I left that, decided to come back with it on another day. Because I was expecting these to be octal transceivers. 
either one whose direction switches for read and write or you know two separate drivers enabled at the appropriate times but these were just they were looking like multiplexers and it quickly became obvious that these were quad devices not octal they had an odd pinout because each data line to the 8080 had the data read to one side of it and the data write on the other side of it and i looked at all the 7400 bus transceivers and 16 pin dips with no success until the light bulb finally went off and I pulled out my Signetics catalog and looked at the 8T series. And after looking at the 8821, I should have thought of that a lot earlier because Prolog used the, 80, the, the 8T26 inverting bus transceiver down in that lower left of the 8821. I showed you in the last video. And, you know, this, this had the same pin out. The only difference is that this one couldn't have been inverting. So sure enough, you know, this schematic was matching the 8T28 non-inverting bus transceiver. So when using that, and it's a little interesting the way that they're using this, they have pin one wired to ground. So the data output from the 8080 going to devices is always enabled and it's always driving data to the RAM and to the output devices, like the output uh, latches. So there's no harm in that at all. You know, the, the data from the 8080 is just being driven and it's always on and these devices basically just ignore that data until they actually latch it in. The data going into the 8080 is controlled by pin 15, which is that one that I came to, to name and identify as data read. Now data read is interesting. It has the same logic state as D bin coming out of the 8080, but that D bin is first inverted by the 4049, I think, and that cr make, creates a not D bin. And then it's inverted again by that U7 inverter. So now it's back to being D bin. But of course, in the diagram, I don't want to just call this D bin because if I called it D bin, KiCad would connect them all together. And that's that's not the way that the schematic is actually connected. You know, this is one signal that happens to go through two inverters. So while logically it's returned back to being D bin, I had to give it a separate name here to make sure that KiCad didn't connect them together. So here it's just called D read. So that's a that's a way that you can you can fall into a make it's an easy way that you can make a mistake. The way I found that was I was in the naming the node mode. I clicked on this. I was going to name it D bin. And I pulled down and I said, no, wait a sec. I already got a D bin. Obviously, you know that comes from the 8080. So uh, you know then I said, okay, well I'm going to give it a different name. This D read. So that's why I'm a big advocate of pulling down, using the pull down to uh, look at net names before you name anything. So, you know, nowadays, this seems a bit of a, an awkward way for Prolog to have handled the data bus. So rather than just using, you know, a, a bi-directional octal bus transceiver like we, we would throw in there now, you know, they use these two quad kind of transmitter, receiver, uh, multiplexer, transceiver that, you know, it's, it's kind of an odd choice. But I guess, you know, to their defense, I expect that, you know, in, in 75, 76 time frame when this was designed, there just there just weren't octal bi-directional bus transceiver. But, you know, something that was just a nice 74, 245, I don't think came out. I don't think it was available in 74, 75. Uh, if I, I looked in my 73 TI data book and, you know, it was pretty slim pickings for bus transceivers. So finally understanding how the data was flowing i followed it out of the u8 and u9 over to these latches for the machine state status byte and now that gave me a much better understanding of what was going on in u15 remember u15 is that nand that i was certain it was a nand i just couldn't quite uh, quite get it to fit enough to get the confidence level up but presuming it was a nand and working through all of the memory cycles you know for a memory io and the io read write and the ram read write a nand fit perfectly so as soon as as i determined that everything fit I then mean, i was i was happy to call that a nand and just like the other one it's a standard uh you know the most common end package for that nand so u7 is just an inverter u15 is just the the requisite nand on this board
I also was able to convince myself that U6 and U14 are those 74-175 latches. I think that was uh, back up on step 21. I was able to convince myself that those were latches. Obviously, I could be wrong on any of these chip decisions. I won't know for sure until I put the chips in and try to get the board running. But I'm pretty sure at this point that even if I've picked the wrong chip somewhere, I don't have anything that's going to cause contention. You know, I'll look at the power when I first connect things up. But I'm, I'm pretty confident with these chip choices so far. I haven't quite renamed them yet, but knowing U6 and U14 are the machine state latches, U7 is inverter. We can see that U that uh, U7 pin two is actually a uh, a reset that clears all of these latches or a not reset. So I'm going to go ahead and I'll, I'll be renaming those this afternoon. I also noticed on that that uh, U7 two that it connected to a couple of other latches. You know, as the diagram sits now, I know that the data right goes to all six of these latches. I'm pretty sure they're all going to be the same 74, 175s. They're uh, the output ports, just four bits in each one. So I need to go ahead and, and finish connecting those, testing them and making sure. But I'm pretty sure at this point that I know what all of these output latches are. And again, it seems funny on those outputs to use the quad latch because it seems wasteful if the user could choose between the Q and the Q bar outputs, it would be different, but they're hardwired. So the user can't choose if they want the Q or the Q bar. They're all wired to be the Q bar. So using three 74 100s here rather than six quad latches, it, it seemed like it would have been a better choice. But you now that 74 100 seemed like the redheaded stepchild in, in terms of popularity. It, it just didn't get, it wasn't very popular. It wasn't made very long and not that very, not, not that many manufacturers made it. But, you know, maybe somebody can show me the wisdom here in using the quad latches. Uh, and as I said, if, if the user could choose between the Q and Q bar output, I could see it. But so far, that's just escaping me. Technically, I'm down to not knowing nine chips uh, that are part of this, this port I.O. And one of these is the port decoder. And I'm, I'm you know, betting dollars to donuts that U10 is the port decoder. It's just starting to look like the port decoder. We know already that U10 is not another 7442 because pin 1 and 2 are inputs and if they were a 7442 those would be outputs. So we know it's a not, not a 7442 so it's going to be something other than that. Now U1 and 2 those were the ones that remember in that advertisement that I found they were MC7234s and I'm going to go ahead and connect all those up and if I'm presuming that those are the correct fit and if they are, then really I only have U10. U10 is the last chip that I don't think right now that I know what it is. Now, all totaled, I think I have about five or six, maybe six or seven hours into this schematic. Now I'd say about five or six hours, and it was, it was spread across a few days. That includes keeping the narrative up. You know, every time I make a decision on this board, I go over and I update the narrative and what my thinking was. So that takes a lot of time, just you know, kind of kind of memorializing what I was thinking at the time. But if U1 and U2 are indeed the 7234s, these six output ports are the 74175s, like I'm thinking, then I'm just going to focus on U10. Uh, if it's a common chip, and I think I'm pretty close to wrapping this, uh, you know, this, this schematic up in a couple of hours. As soon as I get it wrapped up, I know what everything is. I'll just make a little summary video of, of uh, you know, what, what everything is. Uh, before I start the full-blown schematic and uh, before I start populating chips. Now I did have to buy some of these chips so I have an, uh, some, some of these chips on order. Ordered them yesterday I think and a shout out to Ian who sent me a message telling me that Anchor had these 8Ts and the 7234s in stock and they were you know they were reasonably priced. They were they were much less than what I was kind of expecting or even you know, prepared to pay for for those uh, these chips. So thanks for pointing that out to me. That was very helpful. So in the next video, I'm going to finish up the schematic capture, and then we'll move on to, uh, hopefully the chips will be in, we'll move on to firing this board up. Okay, as always, I appreciate your input, likes and subscribes, and so forth. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.